Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for this webinar, uh, which is part of the Grooming and Coercive Control Summit 2023, hosted by Neurodiverse Connection. The Grooming and Coercive Control Summit is our first ever event series, so we're very delighted that you've chosen to join us and be a part of this. Uh, our aim for the summit is to start conversations, collect knowledge, and share lived experiences of grooming and coercive control. This is an issue that affects many lives, but is rarely talked about openly. We believe that challenging the stigma that surrounds it can help accelerate positive change in a critical area. This webinar will be followed by a short live Q&A session. At Neurodiverse Connection, we're committed to promoting the use of neurodivergent affirming language. Our guide to neurodivergent affirming language is available in the resource library section of our website. However, please note that in these webinars, as with any content that we host or share that has input from other organizations and parties, we cannot guarantee that the preferred neurodivergent to affirming terminology is always used. Um, and finally, due to the nature of the summit, there is a content warning for this and all of our webinars on grooming, abuse and coercive control. Chairing today's session is Jill Corbin, the founder and director of Neurodiverse Connection. Uh, Jill is joined by specialist independent sexual violence advisor Sally Adams, associate professor in sociology and criminology at Durham University, Alison Job and Dr. Helen Williams, activist and senior lecturer in criminology at the University of Sunderland. Sally, Alison and Helen are co collaborating on a participatory research project. All three panel members have been involved in work with Durham Police, facilitating reflective practice sessions to support officers to consider how they can adapt their approach to consider and meet the needs of autistic people and people with learning disabilities. Whilst their findings and recommendations are not yet completed, this session offers an exclusive and early insight into the learning and processes of this important research. So we're very lucky to have them today. And without any further ado, I will hand over to them. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, if we start with some introductions, um, I'm Jill Corbin. I'm a director at Neurodiverse Connection and I'm chairing and asking questions today. Really pleased to be here. Sally. Hi, yeah, I'm Sally Adams and I am a learning disability ISFA, which is an independent sexual violence advisor. And I work for a charity called the Rape and Sexual Abuse Counselling Centre. And we're based in Darlington and County Durham. Thanks, Sally. Helen. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Helen Williams. I'm a senior lecturer in criminology at the University of Sunderland. Thanks. And Alison. Hi, um, I am an associate professor in sociology and criminology at the University um, of Durham. I'm Alison Job. Fantastic, lovely. Very, very excited to chat with you all. Um, and I think we're going to start with uh, some questions and a little bit more about your work, Sally, and then we'll hear about the the work you've been doing together and uh, how Helen and Alison have been involved. Um, so Sally, can, can you can you tell us about your your role and your work? Sure. So yeah, I'm a specialist ISFA. So I work with um, clients who have learned disabilities and or autistic people. Um, and I currently support 20 survivors who've experienced sexual violence, um, who, who fit into this, and that's nearly half of my client list. Um, as an ISFA, we, we have been around since 2005, so it's a fairly recent role. And what we do is we offer non-judgmental, practical and emotional support to survivors of sexual violence. Um, the charity that I work for, we support anyone of any gender over the age of 13. So sort of different ISFAs support different groups of people. And we support them whether or not they're going to report to the police. Um, some people haven't decided at that point. Um, what we don't do is we don't tell anyone what to do. It's very much we give them the information and they make their own decisions. However, most of our clients do end up reporting. And so my role is really to help them navigate through the criminal justice process, which is long and daunting. <laughs> um, so really, I'm there as an advocate for them and to make sure that their needs are met. Um, as an ISFA, we also help them to access other services such as health, social care, housing and benefits. So um, as professionals, we can make referrals into other services if that's what they need. Um, 
In terms of our funding, we're supported by the Durham Police and Crime Commissioner's Office, um, and we also receive funding from grants and through fundraising. So that helps summarise it. <laughs> Thanks, Sally. That's really clear. Um, when I started bringing together speakers for the for the uh, the summit, I had quite low expectations for specialist services for autistic people. And I was really excited when I spoke to Alison and she mentioned the work that you're doing in your role. Can you say a little bit more about how your specialist role was developed? Well, it was more recent, actually, that the Ministry of Justice realised there was a gap um, and they needed roles um, for a professional who had an understanding in sort of three areas, really, which is the criminal justice system, sexual violence and learning disabilities, um, which is quite a big ask. So my background is as special needs teacher and the rest of it I've been able to be trained in and learned um, throughout my time. Um, so now I feel I can advocate in all those three areas. Um, the Ministry of Justice funded these positions nationally, but just for a limited period um, to fill this gap. Now that funded uh, funding has ended, but fortunately my role hasn't. So I've continued um, working with the charity. Um, and I think it's because the evidence is out there that, that survivors with learning disabilities and or autistic people um, are less likely to report in the first place from sexual violence, less likely to, to see a conviction um, and, and to even get to court in the first place, um, despite there being special measures for them. So it was seen as, as necessary to, to develop roles for learning disability, I suppose. Thanks, Tally. It's really stark listening to you that, you know, as, as autistic people, we're less likely to report, we're less likely to secure convictions, and also the funding has been discontinued. Um, yeah, it's it, it's hard it's hard to make sense of, but I'm I'm really pleased and grateful that that your work has continued and um and and that locally it's been seen as a priority. Um, and I really hope that by sharing this, uh, you know, other other people, other services, other commissioners will will be inspired and and will also see that there is a gap and there's a need that they can meet. There um, is definitely. And, and and what difference do you think your your role and the kind of the specialist role makes? Um, I think for me, it's been able to bring my own specialist knowledge. Um, through many years of working with both children and adults um, through special schools and through working with helping adults gain employment as well. Um, so I just feel it sort of brought that extra knowledge in. Um, so out of the sort of 42 clients I currently support, there are 10 who are diagnosed as autistic um, and I have two on a waiting list. And seven clients who have a learning disability, um, two of which are also um, autistic. Um, so yeah, it I keeps me busy. <laughs> um, so I just think, yeah, that awareness, we can all be trained obviously in, in working with all survivors of sexual violence. Um, but I think, yeah, it just helps to have that extra bit of knowledge there as well. And how did your your work in your approach and working with autistic people and people with learning disability, how does that differ from from other other people that you work with or from the work that other RISPers do? In a way, it it doesn't differ too much in that everybody works in a person centred way. So we all adapt. So we have a, a massive range of clients. So in that sense, we, we all adapt. Um, I think the main thing for me is it has sort of the adjustments I make in my role is is I can allow more time. So I allow more time for meetings. Um, I, I can assess all areas of support. Um, so all is as we liaise with the officer in charge within the police who's sort of running the case. But sometimes I might need to do this more often. Um, and also I, I find I, I often need to speak to a client after they've spoken to the police because there are things they don't understand and they can find it easier to ask me rather than a police officer. 
Um, I think sometimes in the police, they forget that for the client or the survivor, this is their first time. So everything they're saying is completely new. So if they say words like CPS, they don't know what that means necessarily. So the Crown Prosecution Service. So it's things like that. So I, I will just have that time um, to speak to clients and explain a bit more about what's happening really. So I think that's sort of the main way that it differs. Thanks, Sally. And we've heard this in other conversations as well, that actually the time element is so important. Um, yeah, yeah, I really, I really hear that. And can, can you say more about the adjustments that you make or the adjustments that you ask other people or other services to make as part of your work? Yeah, I think my main adjustment is is time and understanding. And also, I, I can be a little bit more flexible um, in terms of clients who maybe find it difficult to attend on time, clients who, who may not turn up, but probably may not tell me that either, that not turning up. So I, I'll, be, I'll understand and I'll just make another appointment. Um, in terms of other people, it's interesting what you just said, Jill, but I ask for time and understanding. That's really what I want from everybody else. Um, the other sort of major adjustments are that the criminal justice service do offer special measures, which police can apply for prior to going to court. Um, so part of my role is to advocate for that and, and to make sure we can really explain to a judge why those measures are needed. So that's things like um, asking for the removal of gowns and wigs, because that can be really daunting. Um, giving evidence behind a screen or giving evidence on a live video link. Um, now that's available for all survivors um, of sexual violence, but for some people they might need a communication device or they might need support from an intermediary who can come in and be a communication specialist. Um, so really it's advocating and, and making sure that if that's what the client wants, that's available and applied for. So yeah, those are sort of the main adjustments really. Thanks, R really important and really important to know what, like, what's available and what's possible. And I'm, I'm so mm. grateful for the work that you're doing to advocate and support for that. Um, is the, what learning would you share with colleagues or partners um, working in other services, perhaps in, in other areas where, where the funding may not have been continued? I think primarily is to ask survivors what do they want, not to make any assumptions at all. I think there's far too many assumptions made, you know. Just as I asked them, does being neurodivergent, does it affect how they access services? It may do, it may not. Uh, what support would they like? How do they want support to look? Um, what's best for them? Um, and I suppose the other obvious thing is get as much training as you can um, to be, you know, just to gain further understanding and have an awareness of, you know, do they have communication? Is, is social communication a challenge? Um, so being aware of, of, you know, interpreting verbal and non-verbal language as well. Um, just, just so many things. There's an example from the project which you're about to hear about where a police officer actually said to a client, oh, we've got a short window of time. So, and that client, you know, was autistic and was looking around for short windows in the police station. And it happens and it really does happen. So it's that being aware of your language, um, you know, and a, a client might take something literally and, and obviously allowing extra time to process that information. So I would say, yeah, training and, and asking questions, definitely. Thanks, Sally. It, it's such a human response, isn't it? Ask people what they need. Um, and mm. <laughs> so, so, so much of what we talk about and advocate in, in my work with Neurodiverse Connection is 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 seeing the human um and and often our needs are, are very similar to what other people might need but we we need tweaks or adjustments or a bit more time or or, or a slightly different presentation but actually it's not wildly different from what anyone would need um, no. yeah so i really really appreciate hearing the detail of of how um how some of that works mm. for your you know in, in in your work and in your project do you want to say any more 
before we move on to hear about the project, do you want to say any more about the impact that, that your um, work has and why this is important? I think to sum up my role, I suppose hopefully is, is to enable survivors to stick with the criminal justice process if that's what they want to do. So I, I'm sure many more people would pull out throughout because it's a long, long process. So I'm there for them physically. I can help them and be in appointments with them so I can actually attend and I'm there emotionally for them as well. So I think really it's it's that navigation, I call it, it's navigating through the criminal justice system. Um, mostly I work with adult survivors, but I can also support parents or carers and, and be there just to tell them what's happening as well. So I think it's, yeah, the impact of my work is, is just to help them to, to get the justice that they deserve. So yeah, very much so. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I, I can really imagine how important that consistency and the advocacy and support mm -hmm. you provide will be through through that process yeah yeah thanks so much That's okay. um, so, so I'm really uh, excited to hear more about the project and, and the work um, that you've been doing together Helen and Alison if I can invite you to, uh, to to join the conversation at this point can can you tell us a little bit about the the project can you give us an overview um yeah i'll i'll take this helen <laughs> if that's um and then helen can can chip in at, um at, at any point so we've been working with um with sally um at rape, Cri at rape crisis center in in darlington um and we've been delivering um we're not calling it training necessarily we're calling it reflective practice based um workshops are based on um on theater based methods it's a participatory um approach um to to developing um more inclusive criminal justice responses that's really the aim um of the project um overall and we've delivered um reflective practice workshops to police officers in durham and multi-agency practitioners um also working in that area um in in september so it's quite recently that we've actually developed those um delivered those workshops um in in the durham police force area the workshops um involve the screening of a co-created film um called us to alicia's story which we co-created uh, with a group of um of women the us two group and um so we co-created a script um with a group of women with learned disabilities and or autism that's their description um of of their identities and their group um and we worked with a, a local theater company which is a feminist political theater company called open clasp theater company um to develop the script um, and produce um, the film. So Alicia's story um, isn't based on any of the women's individual experiences, but is the co-creation of a character and experiences of Alicia when she reports sexual um, violence and domestic abuse um, to the police um, and the police responses um, to that. So it tried to capture the group's different experiences um, of reporting sexual violence um, and during the workshops uh, we, we screen the film um, and then we invite police officers and other multi-agency practitioners to engage with Alicia's story um, and through engagement with Alicia's story really begin to reflect on their own practice um, and think about how um, things are done um, the responses by um, by themselves as police officers or multi-agency practitioners and begin to work towards using theatre-based methods, thinking about what could be done differently, how criminal justice um, responses could be more inclusive um, and, and working towards that as, as a group. A, a key part of the workshop is a theatre-based method um, where we created still images. Um, so, so participants would get up very much on their feet, creating still images, um, thinking about barriers to justice in, in Alicia's story, and then moving from that first image to think about what needs to change. Um, and so Helen and I as researchers have captured um, the learning from that. Um, so the, the workshops are reflective practice workshops, but as it's a participatory method, um, it's also about us capturing the learning from that and feeding that back to say this is actually what needs to change to make um, criminal justice responses um, more inclusive and responsive um, to um, people with disabilities um, and the autistic um, community. 
Helen, do you want to add anything to that? I think I think that was pretty comprehensive, wasn't okay. it? Okay. <laughs> Amazing. It's so exciting to hear about. Like it 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 shouldn't be radical, but it sounds so radical that it's you know that it's participatory, and that it's creative and that it's engaging. Um, yeah, I'm I'm really really excited to hear about it. Um, Helen, would you like to say a little bit more about how how the project came about? I can do yes. So in about 2018 or 19, we're not quite sure when this all started. Um, but Alison was approached by a rape crisis centre in Tyneside to, um, they'd identified that they had women using their services who were autistic or had learning disabilities, and those cases were dropping out of the criminal justice system very early. So there was a bit of a trend and they wanted to understand more about that and what could be done to support those women, have their cases move through the criminal justice system um, further, or just for them to feel more comfortable with the outcome from a criminal justice process. So Alison was approached to um, to do a piece of research and I came on board as a um, research assistant. Um, I've got a long background of working as a support worker um, for autistic people and people with learning disabilities and, and multiple and complex needs. So I had that learning um, to, to bring with me as a, a as a specialist on the um, on the project. So what we did was we interviewed um, stakeholders, so people who work with members of, of the learning disabled or autistic community um, to identify what they thought the problem was or how they um, understood their role. And we also interviewed some women um, who had lived experience of uh, reporting sexual violence to the police um, and were able to talk about that with us and kind of go into some of their experiences of the criminal justice system rather than experiences as, as being victims of crime. Um, we collated all of that um, learning together and we realised that there was a real gap for a specialist, Isva, such as Sally, who has who brings together all of that experience and that would really help the experiences of women in the criminal justice system who needed um, specialist support. And from there, we um, were in touch with the US2 group of women who are, as Alison said, they are um, a group of women survivors of domestic abuse and sexual violence. And they identify as uh, learning disabled or autistic and or autistic. Um, and they are trainers in their own right. So they go to um, deliver training out in the community to police officers and other agencies um, on those specific issues. So they're a great group for us to work with. And as Alison said, we co-created this film with them and the theatre company. And then we thought about what are we going to do with that film? And the women in us too really identified that the best thing to do was to use it for training, to help people understand the experiences um, or, or you know what it's like to go through the criminal justice system as a survivor when you do have um, autism or learning disabilities, uh, and that's where that came from. Fantastic! Thanks so much. And and what are you learning from 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 this project, from the reflective practice workshops? What what kind of findings uh, are you seeing? Shall I go for that, Alison? Yeah, if you want to. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what are we learning? We're really identifying a lack of cohesion between um, police and multi-agency practitioners, what support is available, what specialist support is available. So we're finding that a lot of the people who've participated in those workshops did not know that there was a specialist ISVA uh, in their local area who could be um, consulted and called upon to support those survivors. So even just for that awareness reason, the workshops have, have really been successful um, in highlighting what services are available. So there was a real lack of cohesion. We found often that people didn't understand um, the role of an intermediary, um, which is somebody to help facilitate communication if there are communication needs. Um, and that was 
often mixed up as we were talking in the workshops with an appropriate adult. Um, not everybody with autism or a learning disability needs an appropriate adult. Not everybody needs an intermediary. Some people um, communicate very well, but might still need an intermediary for specific um, because being interviewed by police is a very stressful situation and can exacerbate um, issues. And we really found that that, you know, those definitions were muddied a little bit for um, for people. So it was really good to kind of set the record straight a little bit, um, a little bit with that. Alison, is there anything else that you wanted to? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, it's also worth saying as well that Sally was one of the, um, so Sally's role in the project was one of the facilitators of the theatre-based yes. um, workshops alongside, um, so Sally might want to chip in as well, alongside um, theatre practitioners from Open Clasp um, Theatre Company. Um, and I think one of the kind of things that really stands, I mean, we're very much at the early days of analysing all of the data um, at this point because the, the workshops happened quite recently. So Helen and I are at the moment are working um, to 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 come out with the, the kind of key findings, which we're then going to feed back to um, to Durham Police um, with a hope for practice um, practice change. Um, and I think the thing that really came across was because we had um, we had a range of multi agency practitioners in the room, but we also had um, a range of police officers that come from very different parts of the police. Um, so police officers that you might meet on the street versus um, those that are in the safeguarding team um, or in, in other teams. And what was quite interesting that quite often training or, or workshops like this tend to happen in silos. Um, and so it was interesting, the cross conversations that were happening um, about different roles um, and and the, the kind of the way that the, the police were working um, and what that might mean um, from a victim's perspective um, who come who come into the um, from So from Alicia's perspective, for instance, um, experiencing these different um, different individuals that they might encounter if they'd reported um if they'd reported a crime um so i think that was quite it was quite interesting those conversations um that were happening when we're thinking about how um you might develop um different um different practices and as helen said there was when we're talking about special measures which um sally was talking about earlier um there did seem to, there was Kind of some confusion about when special measures should be introduced and and when they when they shouldn't be and i think there's certainly some learning to to think about there and going back um to what sally was saying earlier as well about the importance of actually thinking about the individual so the individual victim and the individual um the individual needs um and asking that person um, rather than assuming there's there's a list of things that we can put into place and once you've ticked those off that's the right thing that we need to do because it might not be the thing that that individual needs um, and I think that came up very much in um, in the conversations um, about how it how it could be different and, and part of that is about having the time to spend with somebody um, to talk about what they actually need in place if anything um, in order to support them um, through the criminal justice system, which can be a very difficult um, process um, to go through, particularly in the context of sexual violence um, or, or domestic abuse. Sally, should I? I think, it? yeah, and I think another thing that really came out to me that was quite stark and mentioned quite often was, was police officers and particularly those first responders saying that they they're actually scared of saying the wrong things they're scared of using the wrong terminology the wrong words so much that they're actually scared of losing their job um that came out quite a lot that kind of fear um and some were saying you know that they never met somebody either with a learning disability or, or an autistic person so they had this kind of image created by society or the media that that isn't the reality and that they, they just it was that kind of it was almost a fear you know do I say the right thing um I think that came across a lot and that those initial responders either sort of face to face or by phone felt they needed more training um on how to respond you know to, to everybody's needs so I think for me that came across um and and the most impact that I saw on the course was was the physical part of standing up, putting yourself in, in a position of any of those characters throughout the criminal justice process. 
and how nearly every scenario that was created over eight workshops started within a line of professionals, none of whom knew each other, saw each other work together. And it ended in this circle. Everybody just automatically then created this circle with the survivor in the middle. And it had such an impact to see that visually. Um, it was amazing. And, and people on the course, you know, the responses were so positive to that. You know, they'd heard the word theatre and thought, oh, God, I don't want to be here. Thank you very much. But by the end, they were so glad they did. And I think for me that that came through a lot and they were going to go away and, and, and they said they would react differently now with people, which was great. So, yeah. Thanks, Sally. I got goosebumps listening to that. Um, yeah, really, really beautiful to hear. Um, and I, I, I think it's something that we notice a lot in uh, in other areas of our work that really to make reasonable adjustments and to work in a in a really person centred way, you need a really good overall understanding of what needs might be and what's possible so that you can personalise. Um, and, and I think sometimes what happens when people get that tick list is there's fear that they don't know what to do. And so we need a thing that we can work through, um, but I don't really understand it or what it means or how to apply it properly. And people are kind of th are doing the best they can, mm. but we really need to provide more support for a deeper understanding for that to be personalised and to work effectively and be impactful. Um, yeah, but really, really powerful to hear to hear about this this work. And I'm curious with the project and the engagement and responses so far, have there been any surprises? Oh, I would, I wonder. <laughs> I would say um, for me, what I was pleasantly surprised to learn from the training is that actually everybody from all different roles and all different levels, they all really did want to do better. And they all recognised that that was possible and that they were one link in a chain that if they were able to do better, um, then that might make the, ex the whole experience for somebody better in a small way. And if everybody just tried to do a little bit better, then we could have that overall experience. I was really pleasantly surprised. And I think that is all about the personal connection that you have with people when you get in a room with human beings. It's not always present when you look at um, case notes for example or if you just interview people one-on-one -on -one and you ask them what they do um it really comes through when you get a group of, of people together that that everybody does want to do better they do want training um and and they did really engage in the training a lot of of we did hear sometimes at the beginning i'm not sure why i'm here i don't know what this has got to do with my role and you think oh dear and then by the time you're finishing, that person is saying, this has been great. I totally see why I needed to be on this. And I think we should all be on this. Um, so really making those connections between something that, that you think is really over there um, and having that connect to you personally. I think it was surprising how well people did that and really threw themselves into, into the training. It was really good to see. I was going to say something quite similar, actually, which is, and I don't know if it's fair to characterise it as a surprise, but I think I think it was just that everybody we were working with, even though some, because I mean, it is, it's to some people like theatre-based methods um, might not be something that they've done before, or they might think, oh, I don't really want to do this. And there was, there was a, a kind of a sense of that with some of the um, participants that we were working with. Um, and am I going to embarrass myself? In, in this scenario, uh, but then people really got into it and actually moved sometimes beyond doing um, the still images to actually acting, which was beyond what was what was actually asked um, of people. But I think the thing was um, that was, and I don't know if it's fair to characterize it as a surprise, but that everybody recognized um, there was a need for change um, and everybody was quite committed to um to making that happen um and also exploring the barriers and thinking about what could be done differently um so very much engaged um in in what we were trying to do and from the point of view of, as a researcher because we were collecting the learning from that that's given us real insight into how things what the barriers are currently and what actually could be what could be changed um because we moved from what are the barriers to 
um, in, in an ideal world, what would this look like? Um, and as, as Sally said, it was it was about rather than kind of this line of practitioners, quite often like a, a circle um, around the character um, of Alicia in, in terms of providing support. So it was it was a, a pleasant surprise to realise that absolutely everybody was on board um, with wanting to 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 make a change and make criminal justice responses um more more inclusive but they are there are barriers i don't want to sound too optimistic there are many many barriers um still there still there in place but i came out of all of those workshops feeling quite optimistic love that hope thank you um Sally, do you want to add anything just i think for me my surprise was just how open people were you know in a in normal sort of training you don't get that there were officers opening up and and being really honest as well I, I was surprised by yeah just that that level of honesty and, and openness um and I've said that that willingness by the end to, to realize that that no we can't change everything but we can do a little bit and it, it was great yeah yeah thank you yeah I, I really heard um vulnerability in the example that you shared earlier um, so yeah, it's, it's it's really powerful when people are in a, a safe space that facilitates that that openness and that engagement. Mm -hmm. And and is there any early recommendations um, from this work that you would want to share with with other services with with other areas? Do you want to answer that, Alison, or are we I, waiting for the recommendations? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Helen, were you going to come in or do you want me to? Um, well, I was going to say that it, it it's kind of early to make those real focused recommendations that are really specific, um, because obviously we've got to have that evidence base that, and we need to look at that um, and, and really kind of justify why we're making those recommendations but I think on a kind of um on a on a personal level um I think the one of the key recommendations is just to ask just ask people um what what do you what do you need and I am really aware that the police work within constraints they're very procedure driven and they have to you know tick all the boxes before they get to something um things have to be done in a particular order but that shouldn't take away from the ability to make sure that somebody who is vulnerable and who has um suffered a traumatic incident um is is comfortable and is able to share that and and you know it's really it's a very small thing to do and I think that does get lost in generally in the modern world um, but that would be a key recommendation I think when when somebody is in front of you anybody in fact um, because we don't know people's status a lot of times and, and that's another thing that came out of the train and that the police don't always recognize that somebody um, is autistic or has a learning disability so asking is just that that first thing that would be a key recommendation I would think and I yeah, think, I think the, oh, sorry, Sally, I was just going to say, and connected to that is not making assumptions as well, yeah. um, because we did move, we did move from kind of officers saying like, well, what do we, what do we need to know? And what do we need to put in place? And it's about not making assumptions that one thing that works for one person isn't going to work for the, for the next person um, that you meet. So moving away from, from the idea that there are, there's a set of things that we can put into place and there are special measures available but that they're not necessary for everybody not everybody needs those special measures um, and they won't work for everybody others do but it's thinking it's thinking about the the victim um who's a victim of a a serious crime um as an individual um and thinking what kind of support if any needs to be in place at at this point um, and I think that, I mean, that's learning that kind of everybody was engaging with through through the workshops. There's like a realization, um, quite often within within an individual workshop, um, that there wasn't um, a set of criteria available, and that and it was really just about taking the time to have that conversation, 
um, with um, the person that's in front of you, as, as Helen said, um, and establishing if there are any anything that could be put in place um, that would make this situation, having to talk about a very difficult situation to a police officer, what could make that a safer space? What could make that an easier process? Sally, sorry. You no, know, I was just going to say, well, similar things, really, but I was surprised that they use the same form, whatever, crime. So there's no sort of separate, you know, so separate form for sexual violence. So you could be reporting a burglary or you could be reporting a rape. Um, so that surprised me in terms of the initial account. And also, it seems it wasn't even a question of do you have a learning disability or, you know, do, are you an autistic person? There doesn't seem to be that. And a lot of the police felt that it wasn't a question they wanted to ask. So we ask every client, so with us as RASAC, when we triage, we ask every client that question. And it's not a question that you need to be embarrassed to ask. Um, so that's what I think hopefully will come out ultimately. It's okay. It seemed there had to be a, a reliance on almost, is it obvious? And it isn't. <laughs> we all know that it's not obvious at all if somebody, you know, is an autistic person. So I just felt, yeah, we needed to ask more questions on those initial forms as well. Thank you. Um, so I have some kind of slightly systemic questions, and I think I think we've spoken to a lot of these already. But um, I think, yeah, I'm go I'm going to go ahead and ask a couple of these anyway. Uh, so, does the system work for autistic people? The system doesn't work for anybody. I would I would start with that, and because we're particularly looking at sexual violence and reports of reports of sexual violence, and of course the system isn't just the the response by the police; it's the whole criminal justice system. So you have um, decisions made by um, police officers whether it will go to the Crown Prosecution Service. You have the Crown Prosecution Service making a decision about whether this will go to a criminal court. And then you have the courts themselves where a jury makes a decision about whether um, somebody is um, is a perpetrator of crime or not, because the focus at that point, of course, is on on um, the perpetrators. So there's a whole system there. And we know from rape and sexual assault um, there's um, there's there's low reporting, um, there's low charge rates, and there's low conviction rates, um, and there's high attrition where um, cases drop out of the system either because there's been a decision by the criminal justice system um, to not proceed with that case, or the victim themselves has um, has withdrawn their case because you know the criminal justice system is quite traumatic on it on its own to go through, and it's a known. Um, a known factor that secondary um, victimisation um, via or trauma via by going through the criminal justice system is is a factor. So it it doesn't work um, for anyone, um, and it's particularly difficult um, for somebody with a learning disability um, or or somebody who's autistic um, to navigate what is quite a difficult. Um, process I'm sounding very negative um, and I wanted I'm wanting to find something more positive um, within there but I think that's you know the reason that we'd be doing the research that that we're doing is that there are um, a number of barriers um, for all victims um, and those barriers um, can be more pronounced um, for those with a learning disability um, or or someone who is um, for, for autistic people. There is a little positivity. Thank Shall you, I add Sarah. That <laughs> yes, please do. So to try and say this really briefly, there is a, a national project called Operation Soteria Bluestone, which was funded by the Home Office. Um, and it's, it's a collaborative program which brings together all police forces, academics and policy leads. And what they're doing is using evidence to enable forces to, to transform their response to rape and serial sexual offences. Um, now, I, I'm based in the Durham area, and that was actually one of the trial sort of police force areas for this project. Um, and it's recently, just in July this year, been rolled out in, in all police forces in England and Wales and all 14 CPS areas. Um, it sounds very radical, but they're putting the victims' rights and needs at the centre of um of an approach to investigating rape and to prosecuting which you would think had been happening all along however it happens but they've realized it's actually the victim um who, whose rights need to be at the center and 
already since sort of its its inception in Durham, the cases going to CPS have doubled from the police. So mm -hmm. there is some something, you know, and and it's um it, it, so it's sort of we're used to it in Durham, but other police forces are just getting used to this idea. Um, so that is the hope, I think, in terms of, of moving yeah. forward. Yeah, so there, I mean, there is the hope of change. There's, I mean, there's recognition, um, <laughs> yeah. recognition by the criminal justice system itself, um, and um, and the Ministry of Justice that there is, um, there is a problem, um, and that there's been moves to address it. Um, so there is hope for the future. Thank you, Sally, because I was feeling very negative as I, <laughs> as I spoke there. And and it thanks all. <laughs> thanks all for your for your work and the learning that you're contributing to support positive change the, these kind of projects and um the learning that comes out of them and as well as the individual support that that i'm hearing is making a difference to people um you know both uh within services but also um those individuals that you're you're supporting directly sally you know, th th this is where change starts um, and so, yeah, I'm really, I'm really pleased and grateful to hear from you all. Are there any final reflections or any extra comments you'd like to make before we, before we finish? No, just, I think just take away that, just offer time, support, understanding, the things that we hope everyone does. I think my summing up would be more time for humanity almost, you know, just, yeah, more time for humanity and less tick boxes. Um, and just just get just learn everything you can I mean that's what I do I learn everything I can so that we can support everybody so I think yeah that's my sort of ending statement Wonderful. anything think, to add uh, Helen or Alison yeah I was going to say that um I think uh, sort of a key takeaway from today really should be that there are specialist services and if you are an autistic person who needs that support, there are specific services um, that are available. I'm not saying everywhere um, and I'm not saying that there's not a big long waiting list, but we are getting there. We are raising awareness and we are getting those specialist services um, to support. So, you know, if you are in that position, um, it's worth having, you know, doing a bit of research, having a look around. A uh, police officer doesn't necessarily know who is available um, or what is, you know, what you're eligible for in your local area. So doing uh, that little bit of research, um, you know, Googling around in your local area can really help. And, and there are pockets of really good practice and that specialist support. Thank you. Alison. I mean, I think that's a really good, that's a good note to to end on. Um, and I mean, just going back to when Helen and I first um, were contacted by Rape Crisis Tyneside and Northumberland, which was in um, 2018 or 2019, we're not actually sure, but it was it was a while ago. Um, and at that point, that kind of support wasn't available. So in terms mm -hmm. of finishing on a, a positive note, so the role that Sally does now wasn't a, available and, and there's a similar, um, a similar ISFA role at Tyneside and Northumberland now, and that wasn't in place historically and it is now so there's a move in the right direction and there's a move um in terms of developing criminal justice responses and hopefully um you know if we want to end on a positive note thinking about the things that have changed um and the support that is available um and that there are other specialists across the country um not in every area and that's what we would like to like there to be um but there's it's certainly a move in the right direction Wonderful. Thanks all so much. Joining us now for a Q&A session are Helen, Sally and Alison. We've had, just to kick things off, we've had a response from uh, someone who says, I'm a police officer and there is plenty of scope to ask people about what they need and to be flexible within the processes. It's about the knowledge and confidence versus the legal constraints. So the police officers that we were working with, it really depended on who you were in the police force. So particularly like response officers found that they didn't have a lot of time um, in in order to to kind of work with, with the victim. But if you kind of got to further on in the process, particularly safeguarding um, or CID, um, then they did actually have a bit more time to be able to um, to work with the victim. So it did depend on where they were in the police force. But I agree with you around confidence. 
um, and also the constraints of the broader criminal justice system. So it's not just about um, the confidence of, of kind of officers to know um, what they should what they should what they should do and and how they should implement that. That came across in the training that we were doing, and also. Um, so the confidence to to do it and the constraints of the system um so you know police officers saying it isn't just about us in terms of the investigation stage it's also about what happens at the crown prosecution um service um and in terms of getting that early advice on what is going to meet what's known as the evidential test so that's kind of a system process um so i certainly agree with you but we found that it depended on who you were in the police force how much time you actually had um afforded to work um with victims following on from that um a question from harriet who says uh, this sounds like an amazing project but what are the next steps? For example, is it possible to explore how people's practices changed over time as a result of the theatre-based workshop methods? Yes. So we, um, because we've just we just delivered the workshops in September, and now Helen and I have a lot of data to to analyse, and we're going to be um, writing up our report um, to feedback into um, Durham Durham Police. As Sally said in in the video, Durham Police are also part of Operation Sataria. Um, so we're hoping that in terms of the timing. Um, we'll be able to kind of feed in um, some of our findings um, to those those broader changes that are happening across um, all police forces um, as well. Um, and I mean, in terms of the, so we, I mean, we did kind of gather that sort of information about, um, we've actually just got a lot of it today, interestingly, <laughs> um, feedback um, from the workshops themselves. Ideally, what we would like to do is go back in in kind of maybe six months time to see what has been implemented. So we have um, talked, but we need additional funding um, to do that. So it kind of just come back to research funding, but we would like to do that to see what the impact um, of um, of that was, of at least find a way to capture what the impact um, of um, of the reflective practice workshops were. Amazing. Yeah, I know that we'll be keenly looking out for the next steps of this project and those findings. Um, another question earlier in the session was, um, uh, perhaps uh, Helen or Sally, if you'd like to jump in on this one, what were the main barriers you found that the women reported in the film? Yeah, I can comment on that one. Um, so when we were kind of co-creating the, the film all together, there was a lot of shared experiences between um, the women and also some other people that I'd um, interviewed separately as part of the, the research and all of those kind of linked up. Um, but the main barriers were things like um, uh, autism not being recognised. Um, and I, I interviewed one person actually who um, described some really quite insulting behaviour from officers who when she could not um, understand the question or struggled with communication would say things like oh come on but you're at university you know what we mean um, so a total disregard for the way that um, neurodiversity might affect the way that somebody reacts in a particular situation or the way that they um, would communicate or how they can communicate so that was a huge barrier so lack of understanding of, of neurodiversity as a whole not recognizing how it might impact somebody and um, being cut out of the communication, so having somebody there with you and, and officers speaking to that person, um, and, and general difficulties with, with communication. So somebody saying, um, please don't call me, I won't answer the phone, it makes me very anxious to answer the phone, and they would say, well, we can't email you this, this is very sensitive. Um, so just not being able to have those choices of, of how you get your information and, and how you... Um, communicate and what that does when people are kind of shut off from being involved in their own case is they drop out so it's not necessarily that um the officers say we're not going to take this forward although that does happen quite regularly some of the the cases where people just saying oh I, I can't deal with this this is too much for me I'm going to stop responding or I don't want to take it any further so that's a really key barrier um, and of course, the way that somebody is treated when they are disclosed and then they are reported, 
it's really impactful on how they how their recovery is from that traumatic incident and how they are going forward whether they might report subsequent crimes that that happen and um, so that was a, a major barrier and like has been said before it really depended some people were very um or some officers and professionals were very clued up on neurodiversity and maybe had personal experience and some really weren't and were very frightened of asking questions um, being offensive, using the wrong terminology, um, and that was a key barrier as well. I would say that those were the most, um, the most key and the most impactful barriers. Thank you. Yeah, really interesting to hear. Um, I'm teetering on the edge of asking another question. I can ask one more if we, if it, if it's answered very succinctly. Um, because yeah, this has just been such a great discussion, and we have a couple of other questions in the chat. Um. I think the que the question was, what did the attendees of the training find most surprising after watching that film? Uh, what were the biggest things they reported that they didn't know, the, the, the kind of most common sort of, oh, I never realised that moments? Should we let Sally take that one? I think... I think the most surprising thing was actually the amount of the emotion that, that came out after watching the film. Um, we, we all sort of sat in a circle after and shared shared something that, that we'd taken from the film. And, and I think for me, it was that, emo that emotion and just that level of understanding. And um, instantly there were, there were people in the room saying, this is going to change the way I work. This is going to change how I, how I speak to somebody who is neurodivergent. They, I think it would just made them think, it almost was that time to just stop and think and to have an awareness. And part of the film was about how um, how we all like the same things. We're all, you know, the, the character in the film, you know, like to go out for a drink, like to do all the things that everybody likes. And and it, it was just, it, it was so impactful to make them just think, gosh, I'm gonna do this differently. I'm going to allow more time um, and I'm going to have a greater awareness. Um, and I think we've all said, but it, it came across in the film as well, ask what do you need and not to make assumptions because this the character in the film was actually turned away at the police station and told to come back with a an appropriate adult uh, and that took her three days um so that was a, a missed opportunity um so it's that I think it came through that awareness of what can we do differently you know we can't just send someone away you know we have to respond immediately but I think it, it definitely came over there. Their emotional response was, was quite powerful, actually. Wonderful. Yeah, I think it's a really innovative way of trying to tap into the fundamental sense of empathy to try and circumvent mm -hmm. these issues. Obviously, these are super complicated issues. And, but I think what's come through in a lot of your um, work and the answers is that vital element of empathy that's needed to um, kind of grease the wheels. Um, that is unfortunately all that we have time for. I'd like to thank all of our panelists very, very much for joining us. Thank you so much for your answers and for your work. Um, I'd also like to thank all of our attendees for joining us. Um, we hope that you've enjoyed this webinar as part of the Grooming and Coercive Control Summit. It's been a pleasure hosting you all today. We are Neurodiverse Connection. You can find us at ndconnection.co.uk. Follow us on Twitter at ndconnectionuk and also find us on LinkedIn. Again, thank you all very, very much. Goodbye and take care.